Well, I know that many families will be very concerned about some of the delays that we've been seeing at Dover over the last 24, 48 hours, people trying to get away for their Easter holidays. I would urge them to check their travel plans if they're about to set off to Dover, but that the situation is improving. Uh, there's been a, an acute level of pressure put on the ferry companies and the coach companies, a 35% increase in bookings. It's obviously always a busy time of year, uh, but the government's in close contact with the uh, uh, port authorities and the local resilience forum to ensure that we start getting people crossing the channel quickly. You, you talk about the increase uh, in people trying to make the journey, but of course it's a busy time of year. Um, the CEO of Dover Port has said the difference of living in a post-Brexit environment means that every passport needs to be checked. Do we need to, after Brexit, just get used to this happening at busy periods? No, I don't think that's fair to say this has been uh, you know, an adverse effect of Brexit. I think we've seen, we've had many years now uh, since leaving the European Union and there's been, on the whole, very good uh, operations and processes so he's at and you think that the CEO border. Calls. But what I would say is at acute times when there's a lot of pressure uh, crossing the channel, whether that's uh, uh, on the, uh, the tunnel or on ferries, then I think that there's always going to be a backup and I just urge everybody to be a bit patient while the ferry companies work their way through the backlog. Um, I, there's just one other story I want to ask you about before we get on to your announcement. Um, three <laughs> British men being held by the Taliban. Now, one of them is Miles Rutledge, a so-called danger tourist. He returned to Afghanistan after being previously evacuated by armed forces from the UK. Is it irresponsible? Well, anyone travelling to uh, dangerous parts of the world should take uh, the utmost caution if they are going to do that. They should always act on the advice of the Foreign Office travel advice that's set this up guy's been evacuated before. And I think, you know, if there are risks to people's safety, if they're a British citizen abroad, then the UK government is going to do whatever it takes to ensure that they're safe. Um, and uh, the government is in negotiations um, and working hard to ensure people uh, people's safety is upheld. So you are in negotiations then? To... Well, we're always, we're, if, there, if there are problems and if there are safety concerns uh, to British individuals abroad, then the SDO will be uh, uh, working actively to ensure people are safe. I want to talk now about your policy. It's about child sexual exploitation. Just explain <coughs> what it is that you're announcing today. Well, there's been, uh, there's been several reports over recent years about what I consider to be one of the biggest scandals, actually, in recent years in, in our history. Uh, and that is a, a, a systematic and institutional failure to safeguard the welfare of children when it comes to sexual abuse. And we saw recently Professor Jay's report be published, and that makes very harrowing reading. And what I'm announcing today, and the Prime Minister will be building on this tomorrow, is a series of measures to bring an end to this and properly safeguard children. It's a consultation. Why, why is it a consultation? People have been demanding action for years. What's important to remember is that what we're seeing in grooming gangs or gangs of rapists is in towns and uh, cities around the country, uh, we're seeing a practice evolve, uh, which has evolved, which is taking advantage of vulnerable children. And let's be honest, that's happening. you say it's a great scandal. Why are you consulting? Why do you not just take action? Well, we need to get the legal duty right. Uh, we don't want unintended consequences. But what's clear is that what we've seen is a practice whereby uh, vulnerable white English girls, um, sometimes in care, sometimes who are in uh, challenging circumstances, being uh, pursued and raped and drugged and harmed by gangs of uh, British Pakistani men who've worked in child abuse rings or networks. We've seen institutions and state agencies, whether it's social workers, teachers, the police, uh, turn a blind eye to these, uh, to these signs of abuse out of political correctness, out of fear of being called racist, out of fear of being called bigoted. And as a result, thousands, we're not talking small numbers, we're talking large numbers, thousands of children have had their childhoods robbed and devastated. And there are many of these 
perpetrators still running wild, behaving in this way. And it's now down to the authorities to track these perpetrators down without fear or favour, relentlessly, and bring them to justice. You say that the Prime Minister is going to build on this tomorrow. What else are we expecting? Well, today I've announced that we are going to uh, introduce a consultation on mandatory reporting. What the reports show is, as I said, professionals who uh, had duties on safeguarding and looking after the welfare of children saw the signs. Things were reported to them. Uh, um, concerns about abuse or rape or exploitation were disclosed to these professionals and they didn't take any action. It's outrageous. What we're looking at is imposing a duty on anybody or uh, p professionals who are working in child safeguarding to actually report and take action when they come uh, uh, into possession of information that may raise concern. I think everyone is over the last few years have been horrified by some of the reports and as you say um, the fact that some of these girls were simply not believed vulnerable young people not being believed not being taken seriously and um, do you also accept though that grooming gangs are not necessarily just Pakistani so the Home Office report in 2020 found grooming gangs most commonly white and despite some of the high profile uh, cases that we uh, described uh, they said that the links between ethnicity and this form of offending could not be proven well I refer you to the extensive report uh, about Rotherham uh, several years back, uh, followed by the report by Louise Casey. Um, those two reports were unflinching in their assessment of the problem. There have been several reports since about the predominance of certain ethnic groups, and I say British Pakistani males, who hold cultural values to totally at odds with British values, who see women in a demeaned and illegitimate way and pursue an outdated and frankly heinous approach uh, in terms of the way they behave. We've got to stamp that out with criminal law and proper safeguarding. And we're only going to do that if, as a society, we face up to the facts and the truth of what's actually going on. You talked there about Louise Casey, and a big part of this as well is trust in the Met, right? If you're talking about child sexual abuse and any sort of sexual abuse as well. Mm. Now, the case review into the Met Police said it was institutionally racist and misogynistic. Is it fit for purpose? And you're Home Secretary, right? What are you going to do about it? Well, I've spoken at length about uh, the challenges with the Met, and no one's shying away from the big challenges that the Met faces right now. No, we say no one's showing away from it. The Met Police Commissioner, Rob Rowley, has refused to use the word institutionally racist. Do you think he is actually not really getting to grips with the seriousness of what's happening? I disagree with that. Sir Mark Rowley and Dame Lynn Owens are the right people to lead the Met now, and Louise Casey accepts that as well in her report. Uh, also, Louise says that the vast majority of serving police officers in the Met are decent, law-abiding and uphold the highest I'm sure standards. that's true, but at the same time, we've had serving Met police officers raping and murdering women, taking selfies with dead bodies, joking about domestic violence and race, making racist comments. I mean, it is actually incredible to see. Are you prepared to break up the Met if things don't improve? All of that is totally unacceptable, and the findings that Louise Casey makes um, of the instances of misogyny, racism, homophobia are all totally unacceptable. Would no you, one's would denying you break that. Up the Met if, if it doesn't improve. Well, even Louise Casey doesn't recommend breaking up the Met. So I'm personally not uh, at that point. I think what we've got to do is raise standards of vetting and recruitment. I'm consulting on the dismissals power. What we found is chief constables lack sufficient powers to actually get rid of poor performance officers uh, absurdly and I'm if we need a change in the law I will do that but ultimately we've got to ensure that the Met Commissioner sticks to his turnaround plan and is held to account it, by by the mayor of London happen, an important happen, an important element here is the governance now the PCC in this case the Labour mayor of London has a lot okay. to answer for because okay. he's responsible ultimately for performance and outcomes by the Met um, now I want to talk to you about uh, immigration as well, because in October, when you were talking about your policy to deport migrants to Rwanda, you said in a speech at the Tory party conference, I would love to have a front page of the Telegraph with a plane taking off to Rwanda. That's my dream. It's my obsession. Do you think that sounds a bit, a bit weird, I guess is the phrase I'm looking at, that it's your dream, it's your obsession to see a plane take off to Rwanda? Listen, I make no apology. I care very passionately about 
uh, stopping the boats, just like the Prime Minister does, just like the vast majority of British people do. This is a problem of 45,000 people last year who arrived here illegally, uh, without a legal basis, without permission, abusing the generosity of the British people. We're spending over £6 million a night on hotel so we'll, accommodation, we'll... £3 billion last year. This cannot go on. So we can quibble about semantics, but the reality is, what action are we taking okay, to let's, stop let's talk the about boats? Action then. So will flights to Rwanda take off by the summer? Listen, I, uh, we are making very steady progress. Will they take off by the I, I'm not going to give a deadline as to when flights will take off. Uh, we have to be okay. realistic. Okay. We've had a very strong victory in the High Court okay. at the end of last year on Rwanda. We've now introduced legislation. Okay. We want to move as quickly as possible to relocate people mm -hmm. from the UK to Rwanda. The Sun on Sunday is reporting you're set to announce a deal with a port authority at Portland in Dorset to dock a floating ship housing migrants. Is that true? Well, as, my, uh, as we announced earlier this week, we have, uh, we're going to be moving forward with I'm not asking about procuring... Forward. Is, that, is that true, but about the, the deal in Portland? I'm not going to talk about private okay. commercial transactions okay. in that and case, negotiations. In that case, right, you can't tell me when the flight's going to take off to Rwanda, and we, we've got no information about, about um, sh whether or not these ships are going to be actually used or any information. So if you don't mind, I might not talk in depth about Rwanda or the ships because so far, since the policy was announced, we've had zero flights taking off to Rwanda, we've got zero announcements on the ships. Let's talk about things that are actually happening now, OK? And we can talk about these things when you've successfully sent a single person to Rwanda. Let's have a look. You mentioned the small boats gra graphics. This is the number of people arriving in the UK on small boats. You say there it's gone up and it has 45,755. This is under a Conservative government and it's also partly under you as Home Secretary. Do you accept that things are failing? I accept we've got an unsustainable problem. I've been very this, clear look, about look at that. The rise. It's under I'm aware of the numbers. Do you, do you admit the problem that is, are failing? The, the context is important. We're in the middle of a global migration crisis. The UK is not alone with facing unprecedented numbers of illegal arrivals. You speak to the French, you speak to the US, you speak to other Western democracies. They are all grappling with unprecedented okay, so numbers no of illegal taken. migrants. Let's what I'm saying, hotels, then. I mean, if I could talk, finish a sentence and I might be able to set out what we're actually doing. We know we're, we're all grappling with unprecedented numbers of people. We have to take action now. That's why we've introduced a bill with tough measures, which are both firm and humanitarian. They will introduce a okay. deterrent so that people stop taking the journey in the first place. And importantly, okay. and we'll talk the about evil people smuggling happy, gangs I'm happy to talk are about stopped things. when they actually happen. None of this stuff has actually happened yet, despite the policy being announced in April. Let's have a look at hotels. Asylum seekers and temporary accommodation, you can see it's spiking there. Do you take responsibility for this as Home Secretary? Well, you want to talk about things that have happened. I will show you some progress, actually. So since December, when the Prime Minister made his announcement uh, about our plan to stop the boats, we've struck a deal with Albania. We've now seen um, uh, uh, several hundred, about 500 people, returned to Albania who came here. Um, unlawfully. Uh, we've also seen a record deal with the French, which has enhanced our cooperation on the channel. That's a large part of the solution. Um, and we're now about to uh, procure and roll out bespoke accommodation for asylum seekers so we can start taking people out of hotels and moving in them into more affordable and appropriate accommodation. So you, you talked there about the successes, um, and that, as you say, is partly because of the returns agreement you struck with Albania. <coughs> so why aren't you talking about things like return agreements rather than talking about things like Rwanda, things like hotel barges, uh, barges for migrants that, frankly, you know, I just uh, forgive my scepticism, but they're not happening, are they? Well, I mean, I really disagree with your assumption. I mean, we're announcing these measures because we've been working intensively over the last few months to arrange um, agreements, provisions. These are large, complex projects that we have to deliver. You can't just announce them and they happen overnight. Well, I mean, that's not the real world. The real world, in the real world, and working in government, you have to take things step by step. You have to overcome legal, procedural planning challenges. We need to, we have made an announcement, a pretty pivotal and landmark announcement this week about several sites that we have identified around the country which okay. we believe are appropriate for a housing accommodate, housing asylum seekers. And we plan to start moving asylum seekers into those sites very soon. If an asylum seeker enters the UK immediately, uh, illegally, sorry, so if, if an asylum seeker enters the UK illegally and then admits that they made a mistake, should they allow, be allowed to come back six days later? I don't think um, that 
get, paying a people smuggler thousands of pounds, risking your life in a flimsy dinghy with a thin piece of polystyrene as a life jacket, traveling at 2 a.m. at night in freezing cold conditions is a mistake. And I think anyone who takes the journey is um, breaking the law. The anyone reason... who procures that journey, offers it or facilitates it is breaking the law. Anyone who does that is making a deliberate decision to come to the UK illegally. You don't do that by mistake. And that's why we need a robust legal framework to ensure that anyone who does come from a safe country, remember, they're the coming from a safe the country where they could claim asylum. There is no good reason as to why they should be taking that treacherous journey with the people smuggling gangs to come to the UK on a flimsy dinghy. The reason I ask the question is that you resigned, of course, for committing a national security breach, for committing a security breach and for breaking ministerial rules. You then came back into the same job six days later. Do you just not think the rules apply to you? Uh, well, to correct you, I didn't commit a national security breach. Uh, I set out uh, in full the circumstances of an email that I sent to a colleague about an issue which was uh, pretty much open government policy. There was no national security element, so please do correct your, your, your statement on that. Uh, what I'm saying is here, we need to ensure that there is a firm and robust legal framework whereby if, whereby if you arrive in the UK illegally, you'll what be about detained. A firm and robust framework around ministerial You'll rules. be detained. About, you did commit a security breach. You'll be detained and thereafter swiftly removed. That's what the British people want us to do. They want us to stop the boats. We need a deterrent. We need people to stop making that journey in the first place. We need to stop seeing 45,000 okay. people arriving here illegally. We need to stop housing 45,000 people in hotels around towns and cities in the UK. That's when we'll be able to stop those. And that's why the Prime Minister's made it one of his five key pledges, because he knows the vast majority of British people care passionately okay. well, about we'll, this we'll look, at, we'll look at the figures uh, in, next time you're on the programme and see if there's been any improvement. I just want to talk a bit about you and what you stand for, because when you ran for the party leadership, <laughs> you wrote an article in the Express to launch your campaign and you said we need to deliver rapid and large tax cuts. How do you feel being part of a government where taxes are due to you know, potentially reach their highest levels since the Second World War? I'm a low tax conservative and I know that uh, the Prime Minister is as well and everybody in the uh, cabinet is. And so why are taxes going up then? Well, we've had unprecedented shocks to our economy over recent years, whether that's the impacts of the pandemic, uh, uh, inflation caused by a global energy supply challenge because of the war in Ukraine. Those have required flexibility so on part of our economic policy. You're comfortable with I the current tax level, I am wholeheartedly firm. supportive of the government's measured and balanced approach. We want to you're comfortable cut taxes, with current tax but of course we need to get public spending under control, we need to uh, we need to get the debt down, we need to uh, grow the economy and we need to halve inflation. Those are parts of the okay. Prime Minister's plan. Okay. Now, if I may, you're quite a divisive figure. I think that's probably, you know, no sort of secret. You've become the face of a government's policy on migration that some people find you know, immeasurably cruel. You obviously <coughs> believe in it. Do you relish the fight or is it taking a bit of a personal toll on you? Well, I see my role as Home Secretary as um, getting results, ultimately, taking action for the British people. I see myself as telling the truth for the British people to the British people. I see myself as being a voice for the law-abiding, patriotic, often silent majority. Uh, I see myself being heavily informed by the people in my constituency in Faroe who just want us to stop the boats. Although want, it is fair to say Labour are currently six points ahead on immigration who want us to see common sense policing, who want to keep the British people safe. That's my objective as Home Secretary. And, you know, if the BBC or, you know, various celebrities are offended, then so be it. You talk about various celebrities. Uh, your husband did an interview recently where he spoke out about Gary Lineker's tweet where he compared the rhetoric around small boats uh, to that of 1930s Germany. Your husband said that legitimised some of the abuse that you faced. Do you think it's right that he's still presenting much of the day? Listen, it's not for me to decide uh, who the programming schedule for the BBC. Uh, you know, I, I've spoken about the issue uh, with Gary Lineker. What I think is important, what I think the majority of people really care about 
is the action we're taking. So the bill that we've introduced will make clear that if you arrive here illegally, you'll be detained and swiftly removed. I'm very optimistic about the passage of that bill. We've just had it go through several stages in the Commons recently, we're ongoing with our process. We've just announced new sites for accommodation of okay. asylum seekers. We're making progress on our, on our asylum backlog. We've seen several thousand of cases being made and increased productivity. That's an important element of our plan. We've reached a record deal with France, a returns agreement with Albania. I think we're making tangible process in a short period of time, but ultimately